Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the May 17th Revere School Committee member uh, School Committee meeting. Uh, please rise and salute the flag. Roll call the members. Mrs. Bronson Rizzo. Here. Mr. Ferranti. Here. Mrs. Gravelis. Here. Mr. Kingston. Here. Mrs. Milbury Ellis. Here. Ms. Ty. Here. Mayor Arrigo. Here. Uh, we will begin tonight's meeting with recognition uh, with the Susan B. Anthony Civics Project. So Mrs. Just, Rizzo. Just a little insight. Um, We've all um, have gotten emails and questions on some of the CAP projects going on with the middle school. This particular group had asked if they could come before us. Um, I don't see why not, because we always love when we hear our students' voices. Um, I'm going to apologize. I don't have your last names, but it's Maria, Mateo, Isabelli, Sarah, Brianna, Hugo, Yamsi, Shuban, and Juan. Um, and their educator is Miss Bennett um, from Susan B. Anthony. So um, Dr. Kelly has a PowerPoint presentation. She'll get it up and you can come to the podium and get started whatever way you wish. Paul, do I need to share my screen to project this? Yes, you do. <laughs> hello, school committee, and for hello, school committee, and to everyone watching. Hello, school committee, and to everyone watching. We are the CAP group from Susan B. Anthony. We are working on. CAP Uniform Policy Survey data and presentation. What is CAP? CAP Civic Action Project, year long project for eighth grade students in Massachusetts. Goal create change in your community. Why do we choose uniform policy? One, hard to find colors and sizes. Number two, price expensive and unaffordable for many families. Number three, Comfort. We're asking for the school committee's feedback on our DIA slash project. Let's talk about change. Creating a less strict policy for our school uniform can be very beneficial to the students with bad mental health and a low self-esteem. It also makes them feel better about themselves and how they are being represented or seen by other people. It helps to spread a pro positive attitude and feelings. For example, if someone is complimented about how they, are, they look, it can make them feel better. We know creating change is a, very difficult, but we're willing to take those chances. Should we get rid of logo policy? Here we are showing students votes on having logos as uniform. The logo policy means we cannot have logos on the uniform. 91.4% of students surveyed want to get rid of the policy. That's almost all students. Getting rid of the logo policy will allow students to wear clothes that are easier to find stores as simple as in their closets. Why we should change a logo <coughs> policy? It is harder to find clothes without logos than with logos. We shall allow clothes with smaller logos, but not allow logos bigger than one or two inches. Do you want to add more options to pants and shirts? This image shows the percentage of students' options on adding more options to pants and shirts for the uniform policy. As you can see, the most students surveyed said yes to adding more options for pants and shirts. Options might include t-shirts, jeans, etc. What do you think about adding non-colored shirts? Here it shows the 90.3% of students we surveyed who would like to add non-colored shirts. This is a good idea because if students have a wider selection in clothing, they are more likely to abide to the school uniform policy as it will be easier to. 
Why is college church should be optional? Studies show that students are able to focus and increase in productivity at school when wearing more comfortable clothing. In the article published by Raphael Lee, they stated, people do better during exams when they are dressed in what they feel is most comfortable. They also stated, dressing comfortably has also been shown to increase productivity at school, work, and home, and much more. I also want to include st students with sensory issues. The collars can become a problem because I know people, including myself, who does not enjoy wearing the collars. When being uncomfortable in class, it is very difficult to even focus or participate in the classroom. Non-collar shirts also tend to be less expensive than shirts with a collar. Adding the color black as an option. You can find the color black everywhere and it and is more common in stores. Of students surveyed, 93.4% said that they want black as a clothing option. That's over 90% of students that took this survey. The color black can come in different types of clothing. If the rest of Revere Middle Schools have it, so should our school consider adding this color as an option. Financial, financial state of Revere, why is this important? Quote, 1,147 <coughs> families, or 9.4% of Revere families currently fall below the poverty level. This is a lot of families. With inflation, things are not getting any getting cheaper anytime soon. School uniforms, school uniform clothing is often expensive and hard to find in stores. By relaxing the uniform policy, this will make it easier and more affordable for fam for students to buy uniform clothing. These are some ex examples of expensive clothing. Uh, this is where we found um, our resources. We are asking for the school committee's feedback on our project and presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any school committee members? Mrs. Rizzo. Excellent job. And um, getting up in front of an audience is difficult, and with practice, um, it just gets much easier. But you all four were um, fantastic. I will, um, I will say, I've said it in the fall when we got civic questions about this particular item, um, also about lunch items. The first place I would really like to see you start is with your school improvement council. Bring this up to Ms. Willette, um, have the council look at it, and then discuss it as a group, because it starts within your school. Your school is the one that has um, chosen to have uniforms. We just gave your principals like the tap on the back and the support. Um, you're the ones that need to make that change. It starts with you, um, so I encourage you to Get this phenomenal information. Ask um, Ms. Willette if you can present it at the next school um, improvement council, and then hopefully students. Are you in eighth grade? Oh my goodness. So maybe from there, the seventh graders will take this on, um, and you can work with them on it. But I mean, I am so impressed, and thank you so much for bringing this forward. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Rizzo. Uh, Mr. Kingston. I think the presentation was excellent as well. Um, I'm just trying to be funny, but true, next year if you come to the high school, there is no uh, uniform policy, so you kind of have something to look forward to. Um, I'm, I'm betwixt and between on it. Um, I, I understand it from a perspective. Sometimes from a discipline perspective, it's easier if people are in a uniform, but I also understand the data. I did read it, and I do think you did a great job, but um, again, I agree with Mr. Rizzo. It's really got to start at the school level. Um, but thank you for your efforts, and um, I did listen, and I, it's something that maybe we'll discuss at some point. So thank you for bringing it to our attention. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kingston. Uh, Ms. Gravelisi. Thank you, Mayor Arrigo. Um, thank you. This was a great presentation. I can see you guys really did a lot of work. You surveyed. These surveys come from the eighth grade only. Is that correct? Yes. Cap okay. problem. Um, 
Right, so I'm just wondering, you know, as Mrs. Rizzo stated, even surveying all the students in the school would be a great idea to get a better feeling of how everyone feels, and um, I'm not sure how receptive the kids are to this, but I think even surveying the parents would be a great idea, because if I can remember way back, I'm really dating myself in the 90s, before uniform started, there were parent surveys around in the elementary schools to see what the consensus was, and it took probably several years before the majority of parents actually were in favor of uniforms. Um, so I'd be curious just to see a parent survey, to see their feedback and how they feel if it's more difficult for them to find their student uniforms, if it's more expensive for them, because um, we do supply uniforms for those in need that can't afford them. Um, so that would be something that I'd really love to see added to your project. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Gravelisi. Uh, Ms. Tai? Well, I, cer I certainly congratulate you for getting up here. It's really hard to stand up. You're not even in a chair. It's really hard to stand up, speak into a microphone when you don't know what it is. You have taken the first step toward making something happen. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not sure I actually agree with it. As a matter of fact, I'm sure I do not actually agree with all of your points. Uh, and I would reiterate what uh, Mrs. Gravelisi said. It all started at the Lincoln School. Um, the Lincoln School parents wanted uniforms of some sort. And they were the ones who started out. I mean, before that, it was just a, a general uh, sort of a dress code rather than an actual uniform. And then they're the ones who wanted like a certain color pants or a certain color top or a change. And then other schools, the PTA, started working with that. So, but in generations, people change. As people age, they change. I am one person on here who had to wear a uniform, a very strict one, because I went to a parochial school. And I hated it. And I agree that if you don't feel good in what you're wearing, you know, it's, it can be a real problem with how you, um, how you react in school to other people um, and how you feel about yourself. And that's the most important thing. We want you to feel about yourself. But I have an idea um, that if you do talk to the parents about it, Mm -mm. Uh, you'll need to get them on your side, yeah. yeah. If there are sides on this, I use I say that jokingly. Um, you just need to have more people involved in what you do. But I give you a great deal of, of credit. I'm sure some of your teachers helped you. Um, there were I go back to my years of teaching here at Revere High School, and kids couldn't even wear sneakers. Um, and the girls had to wear stockings. So <laughs> that certainly has changed. Mr. Dr. Colucci thinks that's pretty funny. <laughs> he, he was a student then. <laughs> but, um, and Mr. Kingston, too. Uh, so, and, and you're too young. <laughs> but at any rate, it's a wonderful thing to see you starting speaking out. And I, for one, would be very happy to listen to you again, to have you talk to other people, and uh, come back to tell us again what you've learned, what you're going to modify, if, at a, if anything. But um, this is the first conversation. So I look forward uh, to at least two or three or maybe four more. How's that? I'll be listening. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tai. Uh, Ms. Mulberry Ellis. I'm not Mulberry dismissing Ellis. you. You don't have to. <laughs> I don't have yeah. to you got a history lesson, but we're not done with you, okay? I think she's done with us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I just wanted to thank you as well. Um, you all should be very proud of yourselves. It's not an easy thing what you did. My fellow committee members have all echoed my sentiments. I'm extremely proud as well to watch you, you know, come up. Did you come up with this idea as far as what you wanted to, you know, attack? with the uniforms. So I, I, I feel your pain because I have a daughter who complains about the uniform on a daily <laughs> basis. But as a parent, I feel as though it's very easy. But I can tell you that I do look forward to you guys coming back because I do see some things in here that I can definitely get behind. 
So um, I would take the recommendations made by starting with your school and, um, you know, just ask to be heard and take it from there and then come back and see us. All right, thank you again. Thank you. And Mrs. Rizzo. So I, I want you to leave on a positive note and do not feel defeated because I was the parent that started uniforms at Lincoln School and you can ask Mr. Rizzo, he disliked me for I don't know how many years. So um, elementary, but that was elementary. And I'm looking at you young people, you're moving on to high school and there's so many changes going from junior high to high school and now the freedom of to wear what you want to wear gets thrown in the mix. My suggestion to you is if you speak to your school improvement council, maybe do it as an eighth grade pilot program for a couple of months before the school year ends. You know, maybe look at it that way. Um, there's different positive ways to look at it, um, but it's baby steps and um, maybe you're the students that can show us as adults that Everyday clothing does not direct us in which way we want to go in the classroom. So I say best of luck. And um, also, as a reminder, we got an invitation for the um, CAP projects. Um, so if you have a chance, go by. I'm sure there's many projects that we would love to see. And um, we can go personally say hi to them again. But thank you. Please go out here on a positive note because you did omens work. Thank you, Mrs. Rizzo. Uh, Dr. Kelly. So just briefly, I have a question for the team. Um, did you meet with Mrs. Willette about this already, or do you have a meeting scheduled with her? Great. When is, when is the meeting? Tomorrow. Okay, so timely. Um, I know that she has been taking the time to meet with each of the CAP groups and hearing from students and taking in what they have to say. And um, I do agree with Mrs. Rizzo that the right place for this is at the School Improvement Council. That's where we have parents and students and teachers all able to contribute their voice to all decision making. Um, and I, I, I'm confident that you guys will be able to help sway uh, policy there if you're, with your convincing presentation that you've put together. Okay. All right. Excellent. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the consent calendar. Mrs. Rizzo? Motion to accept the consent calendar. Second. Roll call. Mrs. Bronson Rizzo? Yes. Mr. Ferrant? Yes. Mrs. Gravelisi? Yes. Mr. Kingston? Yes. Ms. Milbury Ellis? Yes. Ms. Ty? Yes. Mayor Rigo? Yes. Uh, we'll move on to the public speak portion of tonight's meeting. Any members of the public? Looking to speak? Is anyone on Zoom? If there are any participants on Zoom, please raise your hand. Going once, twice. Okay, we'll move on to the superintendent report. Dr. Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so we have uh, several presentations to do uh, this evening on under the superintendent's report. And the first one is from Garfield Elementary School. Um, so I am going to uh, bring up uh, some of the folks that are, I believe, going to be presenting on that. Um, and Dr. Napier, please tell me if I've missed anybody. Danielle, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Oh, there you are. Now I can hear you. Um, there's somebody named Elizabeth in the group. Is that person with you all or? 
Maybe not. Is it? Yes, Duquette, yes. Oh, okay, oh, okay, all right. There's, there was no last name, all right. So I'll bring that up, let me just see here. Okay. So I'm just gonna bring up your um, presentation here. Is it possible that I can share my screen and present my thing myself? It may be. Let me see if that I can make. I can... Let me see if I can make okay. that happen. <laughs> Go through the slides myself. All right. <laughs> all right, Danielle, you should be all set to share now. I made you a co-host. All right. Did, um, did doc, Dr. Napier, did you want to say something first before I start? Yes. Um, <clears throat> so, good evening, everyone. Um, I. Just wanted to, first of all, um, take today to highlight the tremendous work that we've done in our with our art program at the um, Garfield Elementary School. Um, as the new principal of the Garfield, and as a new principal after a pandemic interrupted year, I had a, a lot of areas to focus on. Um, but beyond academics, one of my chief concerns was restoring a sense of normalcy and community building. And after more than a year of isolation, it was really important for our students to feel connected to their school and classmates. And one way this has been achieved is through art. Um, <clears throat> our art teacher, Dan um, Danielle O'Connor, as you will see, has really engaged our students on all levels in activities that bring our students together, bring our families together, and have helped to mobilize our school community to support and recognize common causes. Did um, school-wide art installations, art that represents a wide range of cultures at our school, or efforts to support people in need. Um, the work that our students have done in our class this year has been really fostered connection, brought us together, and created an outlet for creative expression. So um, I want to turn it over to uh, Ms. O'Connell to talk more about this really great work. Thank you. Um, I have to give you a fair warning. I'm going to talk a mile a minute because I'm super proud of what we've accomplished this year and I brought a lot to share with you. So I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully I do it the right way. Um, been a mile. <laughs> Hold on, that's my email. <laughs> Weird. Um, oh, slide. There we go. All right, so I wanted to start with just giving you a little preview of what art is like at our school. So let's start with a little preview. <laughs> okay, there we go. Uh, oh, we lost the audio. second home. I pour a lot of love and time into that room to make it a space that is visually exciting and hopefully welcoming to our students. And after the chaotic year we had last year being remote, being art on a cart, I was super excited to be back in our room and just be, have a space to create together. Um, so we kicked off the year with reviewing old routines and starting some new ones, which this year included the use of uh, self-made sketchbooks. Um, so on our first day back, students got to tell me a little bit about themselves by using a secret code of lines, which you can see on the screen over here. And I think my favorite quote of this first time back in the art room came from my friend Stephen in third grade, who wasn't even talking to me at the time. I just overheard him 
talking to a classmate and he was just saying, this is my best day ever. I feel so alive. And it just kind of encapsulated how I was feeling and how I hope all the other students were feeling being back and creating in the room together. Um, our first real project every year revolves around Dot Day, and we base Dot Day on the story of the Dot by Peter Reynolds. And on that day, we celebrate those main ideas from the story, which include bravery, creativity, collaboration, and making our own special mark. Um, this year, students made their mark on our school with an outdoor art installation. Um, during 2020, I went to the Tower Hill Garden for their exhibit they called Yarn Storm, and I was super inspired. All the artists um, went out and covered the entire garden with yarn, crochet, knitting, pom-poms, and just in a time where everything felt really heavy and dark, this exhibit brought me so much joy and light, and I just wanted to bring that back to our students. And so I talked to them about yarn storming, and fifth grade Kim went outside with me, covered some of our trees and the plaza outside of our school with yarn, and then every grade K through five created their own dot for dot day in the form of a pom-pom, which we hung outdoors on all of our trees in our plaza. Students on that day um, are encouraged to dress out of uniform, dress in dots, the more creative the better. And our students really don't disappoint. They um, go all out and dress to the nines and create their own things when they don't have shirts with dots on them. And it's just such a fun thing to see them walking into school that morning. Um, our specialist team really works together on that day. Um, typically in the past, I've had um, parents come in and run stations for Dot Day or just they're invited to just come and create and collaborate with their students and create some art. At this point in the year, it was still really early and I was really wary still of COVID. So um, we stuck with just the specialist team this year um, running the stations, but we had um, CD spinning, which you see here. We had homemade chalk paint. We had cups, which they were able to put into the fence to make designs or stack into different towers. They could build pictures using popsicle sticks. Um, Mr. Labruna, our gym teacher, created a movement station with our hula hoops as our dots. Miss um, uh, Kaplan, our music teacher, was playing music while students were able to color and create dot books that they could take home that day. And some of my older students helped me for their yarn storm. Our fence overlooking the field um, on that day. Um, so it was super fun. Whoops, I think we skipped one. Oh. Next up, the whole school uh, collaborated to create our Candyland Glow Gallery. And Candyland was actually invented during the polio epidemic by a school teacher who was quarantining with children, trying to find a way to entertain them. So we made those connections and um, we created our own candy inspired art. And this time, at this point in the school year, it was nearing winter, nearing December break. Um, I was more comfortable with COVID, and so I, we did invite the families to come through one evening with their children, which also fed into another evening event we had going on at the Garfield that night. I never want students to feel left out, so um, I know not everyone can come after school to uh, an art show, so I, um, in our last week leading up to December vacation, I held art in the Glow Gallery, um, where students were able to walk through just like we did that night with the music playing. Um, so they got the same experience everyone else had. And then we got to play our own life-size version of the game, where I collaborated with the teachers at the different grade levels to give me an ELA and a math question for the game. We had art and music questions. We had get-to-know-you questions, movement questions. And it was just a really nice way to spend some time together before we left for our holiday break. Um, students have enjoyed creating with a variety of materials and techniques all throughout the year. We've created with paint and collage and um, all different kinds of materials. These are some of the K through two artworks that we did this year. Um, and then I got to push into some of the small learning group classrooms on our half days where they got to explore different techniques like printmaking. We made these flowers off CDs. We did floating chalk prints. We did embroidery. We did collage on sticky paper. And then in the older grades, they dealt into more complicated things like value and weaving and texture and creating three-dimensional books and three-dimensional <laughs> artworks like sculptures, portraits. Um, these abstract artworks that we turned into explosion books. Um, we've just been able to create a lot of fun things this year. 
we've grown our appreciation for other cultures. So as Lunar New Year came around um, in the first grade, we talked about Lunar New Year celebrations and um, created our own paper cuts, focusing on the Year of the Tiger and symmetry. And then fifth grade created um, dragon eyes. And we talked about how the dragon is used in a lot of Lunar New Year celebrations as well. We discussed ways our, um, we, we also in third grade talked about the Peruvian um, Quechua, the Quechua people from the Peruvian Andes and their strong weaving tradition. And then students created their own weavings on these adorable alpacas. Uh, we discuss ways art can show respect for our planet. So as Earth Day came around, second graders talked about recycling, and in true art teacher fashion, I dug through the trash and found some um, uh, old worksheets that we could recycle, as well as some faded construction paper that I had, and students used that to create their own worlds. Uh, we focused on artists from all different backgrounds because, as we all know, representation matters. So as we were um, doing our Candyland art, I tied in artists like Ruben Dario Vila, who created the Dulce Frida with 19 varieties of Mexican candies. We've got Mick, Vic Munez, who is a Brazilian artist, recreating famous photographs with chocolate sauce. And Cuban artist Felix Gonzalez Torres, who creates artworks with actual piles of candy. Um, throughout the year, I'm always sprinkling in more recent artists, artists that are currently working, um, and we looked at artist Indy Maverick, who is a Mexican illustrator and graphic designer. Her work's inspired by nature, animals, and texture. So we looked at her series of fancy animals, and third graders created their own fancy animals using texture and pattern as well. Um, during Black History Month, I wanted to celebrate um, black artists, so I created a display in the lobby of our school highlighting some artists, which we um, then delved deeper into in our classroom. Like in first grade, we talked about the artists, uh, the quilt makers of G's Bend, and um, they created their own paper quilts. Fifth graders looked at artist Amy Sherald, and who's very famous for her Michelle Obama portrait, and created their own portraits in her style. And third grade looked at artist Faith Ringgold, uh, who's known for her story quilts, including this one of Tar Beach, where a third grader is seen flying over the city. So third graders created their own interpretation of them flying over their own cities. Um, second grade looked at the company Etta Bees, started by this artist who created these amazing hearts. So we created our own Etta Bees style hearts using model magic. But this doesn't mean we ignore the classic artists. We still had time to look at artists like Vincent Van Gogh, um, which provided a nice opportunity to show how art can be used as a symbol to express important ideas. So we talked about how the sunflower is the national flower of Ukraine, how it's being used as a symbol of hope and support for um, of people that are suffering. And so each uh, the students in every grade created their own style sunflower, and we put those together into what I think is a pretty amazing display in our lobby downstairs for students to walk by every day. Um, and we're not done. We continue to create until our last day of art. And in a year that's been filled with a lot of challenges for, I think, educators everywhere, I can look back on this year at Garfield and probably say it's been an amazing year for art here at the Garfield School. Thank you. Amazing job, Danielle. And I'm sure your students feel the same way you do, that it's been an amazing year at Garfield, uh, in large part because, of the, because they get to enjoy your class uh, and everything that you expose them to. So great, terrific, fantastic, wonderful job. Thank you. Any members, uh, Mrs. Rizzo? So I am just curious, is any of that artwork for sale? Because I know there's a few pieces I saw that I'm sure I was- I'm a student would sell it to you. <laughs> <laughs> for the right price, huh? Yeah. Um, no, it, it, it's, it, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, I like the different media being used throughout, um, the different ideas, the different artists. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for making those students' day so much more special. Thank you. And I also want to say thank you to the school committee for um, considering adding an art director position, which I think would make our program across the city a lot stronger. Justice School Committee. 
<laughs> any any other members with comments? I, well, I just can't keep quiet because it was so spectacular. Yeah, were, yeah. I mean, I'm sure we're all just bursting out. I wanted to clap all during the whole presentation. It was just beautiful. And to see everybody get involved from, you know, from the little kid, uh, you know, Stephen, uh, and to see other people, other kids older, and to get the music involved. You've always been a terrific teacher, Danielle. And it amazes me that you continue to be so creative. But thanks so much for sharing that with our children. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Gravelusi. Thank you, Mayor Arrigo. I know I'm being repetitious, but it was just such an amazing um, PowerPoint. And I loved every part of it. I love Dot Day. I love how you decorated the trees with the yarn. I love how you went through all the different um, Candyland, every single part of it just sounds like so much fun and you know I don't want to be repetitious again but it was just such a great presentation and um, we're so impressed with all the work that you do there thank you tremendous job I know uh, Dr. Kelly really cares about Date as well so uh, uh, <laughs> a different Date a uh, different Date in case you notice I wore my dots for Date yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you, um, thank you for the tremendous work. We really do appreciate it. Thank you all. And Elizabeth, I got your note that it's hard to hear, so we're going to try to ask Paul to take a check at that now. Thank you, Garfield team. Thank you. Um, so next up on the superintendent's report is a presentation from um, Ms. Diana Finn, who's the Director of Guidance and Testing, and she is going to share some information um, with the committee uh, around college acceptances and scholarship information and all of that uh, great stuff to update on what the class of 2022 has accomplished and or is in the process of accomplishing. So. Uh, welcome, Diana. I'm going to pull up your presentation now. Thank you, Diane. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you fine. Okay. Thank you. Um, are you able to share the PowerPoint, or did you want me to do that? I can do it unless you prefer to. No, you can. That's fine. I'll just... Okay. Give me one uh, second. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Thank you. Um... Good evening, everyone. Thank you for giving me this time to present to you tonight about our current um, ongoing and new upcoming partnerships. Um, more specifically, I'll focus on our partnerships in higher ed, financial aid, and workforce development. Over the, the past two years during COVID, we've seen um, the need, the need, I'm sorry, can you hear me, Dr. Kelly? Yes, we can hear you just fine. Okay. So we've seen the, the need to um, improve our communication and collaboration. And without commu uh, communicating and collaborating with our partners, um, they are much less effective for our students. Um, the second slide, please, Diane. And so our current dual enrollment partnerships include a few of our higher ed partners locally. One is North Shore Community College and our Commonwealth dual enrollment otherwise known as CDEP programming. We're offering at Revere High School this summer four dual enrollment courses for students, two that are at um, North Shore Community College as well, and an EMT um, certificate, uh, certification program. In the fall, we'll follow suit with some that are offered on campus at the high school and then some that are also at North Shore. We have partnered with North Shore as um, a partner within the, the FIPSI Federal Post-Secondary Education Success Grant, the FIPSI grant, where we have um, piloted an EL cohort of students and transported them to North Shore Community College. We've created course pathways over the next two years that they'll take a strategic pathway of classes up to 12 credits um, 
obviously free of charge for them. Some of them will be at the end of the school day, others will be after school, but transportation is provided as part of that grant. Um, our Gateway to College students, we've had five Gateway to College students each year over the past four years. Um, where traditionally at-risk students who are at risk of dropping out of high school um, really get wraparound services at North Shore full-time. So they're able to earn full-time college credit and high school credit while they finish their diploma. Um, technically, they're still on our books at the high school um, or at Seacoast, but they're also earning college credit there. And we've been able to increase that number from five to three with help with the help of that, the federal FIPC grant as well. And then the last two bullets, the EOC, the Educational Opportunity Center there, at North Shore offers one-to-one -one financial aid support for students. And then for the class of 2022, we've had several on-the-spot admissions days, FAFSA support, because we know FAFSA completion rates mirror that of matriculation rates into higher ed. Other dual enrollment opportunities, these singleton courses that students take, Bunker Hill is also part of the CDEP funding. They offer individual courses for students. And then Salem State, um, for several several years now, we've offered one course with Winthrop High School um, on Revere High School's campus. Typically, it's an interim philosophy course or a criminal justice course. This fall, we'll have that course. In addition, we'll have an introductory education course, which we're excited about. Um, and just one word about Gateway. Over the past four years, we've had um, 20 students graduate through the program, and 70% of those students have continued on um, at either North Shore or another public state college. Thank you. And then, so early college designation is really an option of dual enrollment. It's a change in funding through the state. Um, it's become a competitive grant that is awarded yearly through the Department of Education and the Board of Ed. Currently, there are 42 high schools and 22 higher ed partners that um, have applied for a designation each winter. Um, and essentially, it is different from dual enrollment because it is a cohort model. Students start early in high school and complete coursework and pathway work throughout high school um, and during their school day, both on campus at the high school and at North Shore, who would be our partner with early college. It's a work to really blend our high, some high school elements and college elements to give students the opportunity to complete academic college coursework, reduce the equity gap, and increase college completion rates. And then some components of early college um, and the early college process that, they're, that the department is looking for within our plan is equitable access to underrepresented students. So we are told that within our um, proposal, we're the only school statewide that has an ELL cohort of students. So we're we're really proud of that work and that, that part of our plan. Um, there needs to be a connection to career, and so we're working on partnering with STEM internship placements, both through our ELO um, professionals at the high school and also through North Shore. <coughs> academic pathways, um, early college needs an academic pathway, so we've selected STEM, <coughs> computer science, um, so students, as they complete their um, minimum of 12 credits at North Shore by their junior and senior year, they would select a pathway to, um, to graduate. And then lastly, robust student support. So they would, or they would have the support of the high school counselors and early college teacher, as well as all of the supports that North Shore offers. One thing that we are particularly proud of is our curriculum alignment that our content directors, um, Dr. Costa, Dr. Porter, and Ms. Lavalita spearheaded this year um, at the end of last year and then throughout this year and that have been approved through North Shore's board and academic deans um, removes barriers so that students are able to submit their transcripts if they want to take a dual enrollment course or an early college course um, and if a student passes with a C or above for example ELA 12 the college removes the barrier of AccuPlacer or PSAT scores in order to place out of a developmental a developmental course. Um, and so that work's been done at the ELA level, the math level, and the ELL level. So extremely proud of that work.
And so some repeat on this slide, just early college participation promotes a more equitable access to higher ed, curriculum alignment. MICAP is the state, um, the state college and career curriculum that is um, it needs to be all encompassing throughout the school. It can't just be counselors pushing into advisory. So it needs to be within all content, within all lessons, it's all hands on board, um, especially with first generation students to make sure that it's within their day every day talking about um, preparing for their future, whether it's within a college, a training program, a career. And then lastly, for early college, there are many opportunities for communities of practice within that and to meet with other districts who are participating. So these are our um, partnerships within higher ed and careers and external learning opportunities that students um, are able to participate in. Um, some of them, you've certainly heard about some of them before in previous presentations that I've made, but I would like to highlight a few in particular here. Um, certainly our, our mass general research opportunities and youth scholars and very specific programming like BU Grow, a research opportunity, summer research opportunity for young women, the Reagan Institute at MGH, MIT, and Harvard. Um, and then the, the Sheriff's Department Student Enrichment Program and Entrepreneurship Program at Suffolk. Those are very targeted programs that students participate in after school hours, on weekends, during summers, and through vacations. Um, some things that go on during our school day that we've used the information that previous classes of seniors through the senior survey has told, have told us, and they've told us that although like the huge college fair once in October with 200 schools is great, it's also very overwhelming for a lot of students. And so post-COVID, we felt um, initially because they were just smaller, but we, we feel like they target students um, kind of more personally. We, we had nine mini college fairs this year. Um, and so some of them were trade-based, some of them were STEM-based, some were business. It was all um, based on major. Um, so it was a really excellent opportunity for students to be able to um, see 10 to 15 schools in their major. They could go to any of them or all of them. Um, and we got some really great feedback from colleges and from students on that. Um, then way down the bottom um, of this slide here, we, again, listened to some senior feedback. We provided info sessions, group trips, um, individual interviews with some pre-work to some new partners here, Local 12 and Local 6 in particular, um, Feeney Brothers, Gas Fitters, Roots Culinary, so bringing these partners in to meet with students, often in the past it was, you know, what connection does a student have to someone who works in a union? And we know we can't rely on that anymore. We want to bring these opportunities to our students. And we felt that we took um, some really great steps towards this this year. We'll continue to do so um, in the future. Some of the financial aid resources that we have, um, we had... Our counselors retrained, and every year there is a refresher course that they take on financial aid with all of those changes, how to help undocumented students, how to help students get more need-based aid, file, file financial aid, um, waivers um, for their families. Um, and in addition, we had we partnered with USPIRE, a nonprofit out of Boston who provided one-on-one -on -one student meetings in multiple languages for students. Same as the EOC at New Wells Shore, but the need is so high that we want to make sure all the students have the opportunity to have that one-on-one -on -one meeting with their parents when their parents are available. And then our next two slides here are the typical slides where, you know, our, our highlights of the class of 2022, where students were accepted this year. Um, on May 1st, students had to make the decision and send in their deposits to a school that they decided to attend next year. And we have seen an increase in the public two and four year schools. We know they are an excellent deal. We know that they are um, giving our students merit-based aid, um, which is 
directly related to their grade point average and need-based aid, which is related to their estimated family contribution, which is determined by the FAFSA. Um, so counselors and financial aid counselors are helping students and families make those challenging decisions. But we've seen more of a trend towards the two and four year public. And students are more likely to have the conversation about a training program, a two year program that could lead to a certificate. So they're able to make more of a living wage and then go on to a four year school. Where in the past and pre COVID we felt that, that those conversations students were less likely to um, be open to. So then the next slide here is trends that we're seeing in um, in financial aid and in college acceptances and how students are looking for college programming. Um, like I had mentioned, students are, are much more frugal and level-headed in some ways about making the decision and how affordable it is, how cost-effective it is, how, how likely it is that they'll get a job after. Should I look at the two-year or four-year public now and then a private school for my master's or graduate degree? Um, certainly after COVID, students are looking for more of a flexible class schedule. Um, and then down the bottom right there, we know that students um, are looking at things beyond their four-year bachelor's degree to prepare for their future, not just the traditional. And that a third of Gen Zers say that the financial fallout of the pandemic has made it unlikely that they will pursue a four-year degree. And so we've heard this these conversations, counselors have heard these conversations and we've, you know, it becomes even more important that the role of the counselor, the social worker, the advisory teacher, the the connection that the students have within our schools, it becomes even more important um, for those conversations to happen. And that a four-year degree is certainly for some students, but it's really important for students to understand what they're looking for, what their strengths and interests are, and then have the opportunity to partner with their counselor who can, who can connect them with a program that could meet those needs. And then the last slide here, I think I may have already gone over some of it. So matriculation and financial aid trends nationwide. We continue to see an increase in applications. This is partially because students just want more options and because we've seen an increase since COVID of SAT optional and test optional schools. Um, the selective tip top schools are still at below a 10% acceptance rate. Um, there's when we've seen this at the, the third and fourth bullet there, we've seen an increase in two and four year um, public school matriculation, an increase in merit and need-based aid. And as I mentioned earlier, the FAFSA completion rates, which we work really hard on and, and we run those reports weekly in the guidance office to see who's completing their FAFSA, who do we need to reach out to because the FAFSA reports and the completion rates almost always exactly mirror those students who actually step foot on campus um, in the fall. And we wanna make sure that students are getting every penny that they, that they can. And that's all I have. I'd just like to take a moment to commend our counseling staff um, within the schools for communicating and collaborating with each other and with our outside partners. And of course, like beaming with pride this time of year for our class of 22 and everything that they've overcome um, the past two and a half years. So thank you for again for letting me present to you tonight. Are there any questions? Any members? Uh, Ms. Um, Milbury Ellis. Thank you, Diana. I just have a couple of questions for you. Um, I'm curious as to the number of students that are headed to colleges uh, for the class of 2022 and where that falls in line with past years. I'm sorry, I can't really hear the question. Sure. Can you hear me okay now? Now I can a little better, yeah, thanks, Aisha. Okay, so my question is, um, I, I guess I'm looking for like the number or percentage of students that are headed to college from the 2022 class, and I'm curious yeah. as to where that number falls with respect to past years, whether right. we've increased that number or it's gone down. Mm -hmm. So right around this time of year, we hover around 55%, and then we've seen, the past, just like we have the past few years, that that the last month or so of school, we run 
info sessions for our two-year schools to get students enrolled and FAFSA session for our students to be enrolled um, in the fall. Typically, we're up almost at 70%, 65 to 70% of students going to two and four-year schools. Um, the past several years with COVID, we get the numbers back in January of those students, that percentage of students who show up on campus through the, the National Clearinghouse, and it's been much lower, so it's been around 50% um, the past two years post-COVID of students who have shown up on campus. Um, and we just, we know the importance of the FAFSA. We know the importance of getting students onto a college campus before the end of high school so that they know where the supports are on each campus. Um, and we're, you know, we're taking steps to make sure that happens for all of our students, especially for our state schools. Um, other than a couple of smaller states, Fitchburg, MCLA, um, we had field trips to every single state school this year, which we're really proud of. We're open to, they were open to any junior and senior, so we want to get students on campus as well. Okay. And then for the external um, learning opportunities, I'm curious as to how, how the opportunities are presented to the students and if they're presented to, do all students know that these are available to them and, and how they find out about them? Yeah. So our ELO counselors, we have three of them. One focuses mostly on early college and dual enrollment. One focuses on internships. Um, and then one focuses on making sure that all of our opportunities are open to our EL students. So they communicate to teachers, to students, and to parents, as well as to um, our traditional guidance counselors to make sure that everyone is aware of the opportunities. Um, in addition, we have an RHS opportunities page that we've had over 300 posts on this year, multiple languages to students. Every student is a member of it, so they get that um, notification as well. On the morning of, when we have an info session, let's say for a trade coming in, um, emails are sent out to teachers, announcements are made. Um, and then at the end of every year, we have students take an interest survey so we can identify these students may want to be an electrician. Mm -hmm. So we can go and pull those students from advisory and, and ask them, do you want to see, you, this is how you filled out this form last year, are you still interested in being an electrician, this is an opportunity right now that you can come and, and learn more about. And, and are these... Uh, for our internships, those are open to 11th and 12th grade students. Any 11th and 12th grade student this year and last year, um, the Department of Education had a, a grant that um, our seniors were able to be paid for their internships. Hopefully that continues in the future. And then for our ELOs that are... Um, Partnerships on weekends and um, vacations, summer programming, we have those info sessions. We, we try and make sure that they're both during the school day and right after school for students who um, work or they're not able to get to the after school session. So we have them both during the day and after school to open up access to more students. Thank you, Diana. And do, do you find that all of these, um, all of the opportunities that you have listed are filled? So I would say the ones on the, I can get the information to you. Sure. Internships on the whole were down the past few years because of COVID and we weren't able to run many of them. But right now we have over 125 interns out in the, in the community. The more selective ELOs, the Mass General Youth Scholars has gone from, that's funded through Mass General, it started at 10. Um, this year, unfortunately, they were only to fund, uh, able to fund five positions which is a, it's a four-year program. So some of them are very selective, um, where others are more open-ended, as many students as possible um, can participate. The ones that we're able to run within our in-house are you know, open-ended and all are welcome. The ones where we partner with another um, you know, institute of higher ed on a weekend or, or a vacation, there, there are limited seats. Okay. And, and um, I did have a question about, you know, you hear that there's, um, there's with, the, with the changing in the grading system, that there are difficulties with um, college entrance exams. And this is just, you know, word amongst the rumor mill. I have no facts whatsoever to even support that statement. But I'm, I'm wondering what your experience has been. 
I'm sorry, with my experience with, with what? With college admissions and with the with the grading system and whether you're, you know, you actually you're actually finding any difficulties. So we haven't seen a difference in the past two years with our change in grading systems. We have not seen a difference as of yet. Um, last year, we did have students have the ability to earn honors level um, GPA weight within our DTRACT classes. Um, and we are, while the details of that were not, I'll say power school teacher friendly on that side of it, tracking wise, we're working to figure out the best way to make sure that students are able to be heterogeneously grouped and still earn that honors designation. So recently I've, I've um, met with the program directors at Somerville High School and we're meeting with Concord High School in New Hampshire who have competency-based report cards and have, have detracted. And um, they've run into some of the same conversations and struggles that we have. Um, Somerville, for example, as their way to track their honors versus college prep students and their heterogeneously grouped classes, they, students elect halfway through, they're going to take the honors level within that course, and they're going to do that extension work um, within the standards, and there are students that, that aren't. Maybe they'll do it in math, they won't do it in their English course. And so there are different ways of, of doing that. Um, that, you know, with the new administration coming in at the high school, I look forward to having those conversations to make sure that our college acceptance rates don't change because you know, we are so proud of our students and the last thing that anyone um, will have is, you know, those yeah. taking the wrong turn. So right. we're all working hard to, to make sure those opportunities are open to students still. So. So it, I'd, I'd like to respond to that as well. Sure. One of the things that we did do um, last year for parents was host uh, an information sen session uh, and Dr. Perella actually arranged this. We had admissions officers from a number of colleges um, be part of a presentation. And uh, I think one of the key takeaways that they wanted parents to have from that session, and Diana, maybe you can remind me which schools were there. I, I know that there were some from the UMass system. Um, BU, I believe, was there. Suffolk. Uh, I think uh, UMass Amherst, Bridgewater. Westfield, maybe UMass Boston, too, Diane. Okay. And um, one of the key takeaways that they wanted everybody to hear is that this work that we're doing around mastery-based grading in Revere is not new or unique. And it's not something that colleges are unfamiliar with. It's happening across the country as we try to reconstruct our K-12 through education systems into um, programs that will serve the needs of kids going forward as we move out of an industrial age and out of the factory form of mm -hmm. education. Um, so colleges are aware of it and, and know about it and are familiar with it and do not make decisions about accepting or not accepting students based on their competency-based report card or their traditional. And I think Diana's point about making sure that we have our courses set up so that all students can access and earn honors credit um, at all times is really the most important next step for us. Thank you. Thank you, Diana, and thank you, Dr. Kelly. Uh, Mr. Kingston. I just wanted to thank uh, Mrs. Finn for her presentation. I appreciate the work, hard work she does and all her staff, and I appreciate the work they do to help get the kids into whatever program suits them. I, I, I know, Mrs. Finn, that your family is very involved in the trades, so I know that that side of the coin is also very well taken care of, and I just really do appreciate your efforts. Thank you very much. Ms. Tai. Thank you. Diana, it doesn't surprise me, and I'm sure not anyone else in this room, that their number one concern is about money and affordability, about can they make it through. And I think that was driven home to me because I was in a a small gathering of new graduates from uh, college, and they were bemoaning the fact that they had such huge student loans, particularly the ones who had taken out the loans 
to go to a private college, as opposed to the ones who had gone to the UMass system. Uh, and they uh, were able to go on with their lives and pay for graduate school. Uh, so that's a lesson maybe that some, some of our kids, well, I'm sure they do know it, but uh, that, that it's good to drive home to so many of our kids uh, because you can get uh, a, a public college undergraduate degree and then go on. I myself did that. I went to uh, Boston State and then went on to BC. And, uh, and it certainly worked out well for me. And these kids were all saying that and the ones who had not done it were really kind of bemoaning uh, that. So it is so important to find a way to look far ahead about what it will be like if you cannot, if you are going to be strangled, and it is a stranglehold, uh, by these lenders uh, for many years. And it's not going to be until your 30s when you finally have some independence from debt. So thank you, Diana. Thanks for all you do. You're always in there and always pitching for the kids. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ty. Ms. Franti. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Diana, um, do you guys look at the tuitions from year to year with different schools? And if we do, is how much would you estimate the raise was from last year to this year? I'm sorry, I can't hear. Okay, I was just asking about the tuitions, um, and I know they went up. And I don't know if you get on that part of it, of you know, what the kids have to pay to go to school. I was just interested in basically what the raise was and just some of the schools from last year to this year. I'm sorry, I can't hear, understand the question that's all so coming in. I, I think he's asking for, sorry, sorry I'm shouting. I know there's an audio problem, which is why I'm shouting. Um, there, he's asking for a comparison of college tuitions from last year to this year, if you know how much it's gone up. But I don't think that that's information that um, the guidance office tracks too carefully. Am I right about that, Diana? They can't hear anything, Paul. It's just, it's all kind of muted. Yeah. Not really muted, but kind of cloudy muted. Sorry. Try it again, um, Diana. Can you hear me now, Diana? It just sounds very far away right now. I can't hear specific words. I know you're talking, but I can't hear the specific words. Not, I don't know what else to do to this to like change that. Okay. okay thank you, Diana. Okay, we're back from our recess. Um, I do recognize uh, our election commissioner from the city of Revere in the audience. I'd like to give him an opportunity to um, address the, uh, the school committee. Uh, just name and address for the record. Thank you, Mayor, members of the committee. Paul Fahey, I'm the new election commissioner. <clears throat> and uh, I don't live in Revere, I live in Melrose, but um, Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, I've been in the position since December. I know I've gotten to meet a number of you. Um, I'm not going to compare the challenges that elections had to the challenges the schools have had. That there's no value to that. But obviously, it's been difficult on, on both levels. Uh, my predecessor had a tough last two years with COVID and then a, a tough last year with uh, so many special elections. Um, and I came in at the tail end of that, so I got to observe the, the two Senate elections and then the regional school district election, which was helpful. Um, obviously, a lot of polling places were changed as a result of, of COVID, and I think in general, and I speak for the election commission uh, board as well, uh, we think overall that that configuration is a good one. We've had a lot of conversations with the superintendent, uh, great cooperation in the time I've been here, and, and Diane spoke highly of the cooperation prior to that. So. Not to get too far in the weeds, but you know we are we had redistricting, 
based on the census, re-precincting. So there will be some polling changes. Um, but in the conversations that I had with the superintendent, I, I think we both agreed that it would be really important and really helpful if on the days that we have election citywide, which um, would be in September and November of this year, uh, if the buildings were, were available. We are concerned about the elections, but we're also, just as you are, concerned about the safety of the students. Um, <clears throat> uh, one thing that I will mention, um, and I've had conversations with the mayor's office, with the new HR director, as well as with, as with the superintendent, um, in an additional level of sort of security for our election workers, we will be doing Cori checks on all of our election workers um, over the summer, uh, existing as well as new people, um, just out of an abundance of caution, frankly. Um, so I just, I'm really here to, to answer any questions that people have, but um, the degree to which we could uh, have that availability of, of the schools. It will be the same buildings that we've been in. There'll be a slight change. There'll be more precincts in the high school than there were because we used to vote, at, Ward 3 used to vote at St. Anthony's, but that's no longer in Ward 3. So other than that, the other schools, which as I say, at least in my observation from the feedback I've had from both the school department and my predecessor, um, overall has worked well. And uh, we want to work on enhanced signage, certainly on enhanced communication. Um, you know, there were polling place changes when we had the, the, the regional school election, everybody voted at St. Anthony's. We have a special Ward 5 election. It'll be, it, it's a little confusing because it's the current ward, not the new ward. So there's still some pieces to this. So we think the communication piece with, you know, working with the school department, working with the community is essential. And signage, uh, we did a poll, um, a survey on the city website about election issues. And one of the common, and I, it was not a surprise, it just reinforced what I think I already knew and what I had heard from folks, uh, the election commission, as well as folks who had weighed in, was um, that signage was not, <clears throat> was not good in the past, or was not as good as it could have been. So that's something that we'll be working on as well. This year, I understand, is tricky with the September primary because it's so early. It's, it's the day after Labor Day, which I know creates challenges. Um, so I'm here to answer questions, but um, I, I, I've spoken to the superintendent. I know we'll figure it out no matter what the decision of the committee is, but um, it, it would be my opinion for what it's worth that uh, you know, if we can have some flexibility with schools on those days, it's just, I think it's gonna frankly make it easier for everybody. So thank you, I wish you the best and uh, happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Paul. Uh, any members have any questions or comments? Ms. Milbury Ellis. Sure, I just have a, I'm, I'm curious as to why we're not using the, using other buildings that may be available within the, the district for elections as opposed to going to the schools first. So there are not really that many city, and when I say city, I'm including the schools. So let's say public buildings. Um, there's been a move away from fire stations, which frankly I totally agree with. I don't think fire stations lend themselves to, to safety. Uh, <laughs> there's fire, and then people are running in and out of the building. Um, they're, they're spaces that are often not very well climate controlled, so you have a lot of problems with, especially if it's a particularly cold day or a particularly hot day. Um, I think in, in most of the communities that I've been talking to, and in, in even in my previous experience, work, I worked for mayors in the past. You know how that can be. But, um, <laughs> sorry, Mayor, I couldn't resist. Um, <laughs> I think generally school buildings lend themselves to this use, um, the, the, the way they're built, the, the big spaces, you know, whether it's a cafeteria or a gymnasium. We are moving more, this happened during COVID, but I, it's something we wanna continue to having fewer polling locations that we can staff better, that we can be more, you know, use our resources better. We're moving more with, with new technology for, for folks with disabilities to vote, moving more to, um, you may have seen these or heard of these poll pads where we get away from, it's such, one of the things I've learned is that it's such a paper dependent system. I mean, we kill way too many trees and a lot of communities are moving toward toward more you know, t technology that sort of lends itself to being more centralized. So I know there's been a movement away from some of the traditional locations and, and we've gotten feedback and anecdotally, you know, I've always voted at location X and, and I totally understand that. I think my thinking is over the last two years, people have kind of gotten used to this new configuration and why would we necessarily want to change that again? I don't, from, from my perspective and from the commission's perspective, I don't think there's a really compelling reason to it does bump up against the school needs, and we are sensitive to that. So, you know, and last year was particularly difficult because there were so many special elections. It was such right. an unusual year. So I totally understand that. I can't tell you that will never happen again. This, you know, I was thinking, oh, this year is going to be normal, and then we have a special. But, you know, it's one ward. It's, it's in the summer. So, you know, th these things do happen. But I think the confluence last year with, you know, two longtime legislators retiring and, and, and you know, all of that, happening um, hopefully will be minimized in the future that we'll generally be looking at the 
you know, September, if, you know, next year for the local elections. If there's a preliminary election, it would be in September, and then the normal election in November. So we, we would like to stay with this configuration, if at all possible. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members? Okay. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. So I just want to put some context around um, Mr. Fahey's comments. Um, as you know, um, it's your no, I think they get it. Um, when the school committee voted at the April meeting to approve the school calendar, um, there were some misunderstandings, I guess is the way that I'll, I'll place it. Uh, and how that calendar had been adjusted from the draft that had been proposed prior to that. Uh, in March, we took an initial look at the calendar. There was some feedback from the committee about uh, not having school on the election days um, and some other corrections that were made. It was a really preliminary draft that was shared in March. We made those adjustments in April and made some other adjustments in order to make sure that we were meeting the requirements of the teachers bargaining agreement, but also making sure we were structuring the school year to honor the best interest of students. And um, subsequent to that, with that misunderstanding, um, the committee had another meeting and uh, decided to reconsider uh, the calendar. As you all know, most of you were present for that. I was not, because I was uh, away at a conference when that meeting occurred. Um, and some things that emerged from that meeting were some misconceptions about exactly where, which parts of which schools are used for voting, and the degree to which that would impact the operations of the schools. And I've been able to share with the committee since then um, that I had been working with Mr. Fahey, as he indicated, to identify places that we felt were more highly manageable in terms of having elections. Um, and one of the issues that we do have is that in two of our schools, the elections are held in the cafeteria. Um, that's at the Hill School and at the Wayland School. Uh, and so trying to operate a school where you have no access to a cafeteria and feed children um, becomes a little bit arduous. So I think that's why he wanted to come and talk to the committee and just um, share his thoughts about uh, the change that was made to the calendar, reinstating uh, September 6th as a school day. And I know the committee did that in the best interest of teachers and kids to make sure that the school year ended on a day that would uh, be most beneficial. Um, but I, I think that we're back in the same conundrum um, that we were in before, so. Dr. Kelly, can I, I have a question. You said the Hill and, and the Whalen School, was, wasn't voting at St. Mary's for that area? I have no idea. I am notified of the okay, yeah, polling no places, time. yeah, which buildings by the by the um, <clears throat> election commissioner, and so. I mean, I get it. I understand why they would want to use the schools. It makes most sense from their perspectives, but I'm also um, I'm conflicted because I just feel like kids should be in school as opposed to being off because of an election. I just. That's my thought on it. But I can see the need. Um, however, I just would hope that we would try to use other buildings first before we, we automatically use the schools. And I, and I will say that we don't use all of the schools. We, so it's, it's not um, as if there is voting in every single one of the schools. Uh, they use five of the eight buildings for election. And one of the things that I have said as we've talked to the election department and these changes have happened with a new leader and um, is that voting is perhaps the most critically important thing that any one of us can do in our lives. Um, and it's not lost on me how important it is to signal to students and children at a young age that those are th that that's a right and a privilege that they should engage in every opportunity that they get. Um, so I, I definitely don't want to make do anything that's going to make it harder for the citizens of Riviera to exercise their right to vote and, uh, and make sure that the people are able to easily participate in that civic exercise. But I agree with you that it is a challenge um, to not have school. I just think that 
there could be a happy medium um, where we can recognize the need to hold elections and separate uh, the folks who might come in to vote from our student body, which we really want to keep protected, um, primarily by not having school on election days. And what that does is it puts a little tweak to how our school year is going to be, and that might not please everybody. Um, so I don't know. I think decisions need to be made. I don't know. Can those days be forgiven? One day. It could, it's two days, no, and if there's no, special elections, the special it, elections already off. But okay, but that's for this year. There's there's still the chance that we could have a year where we have more than we have special elections. I mean, what happens when we get into maybe three elections, four elections? I mean, that could happen. I'm I'm just. It could happen. You're right, and and we had a little bit of that situation this year because right. there were a couple of special elections, and we kept the schools open around the elections. It meant that in the schools like the Beachmont, where we use the gym for voting, um, students couldn't have phys ed. And because mm -hmm. of the need to set up in advance of the election day and have everything ready to go at 7 a.m., and then the need to secure machines after the election, it meant it's that like kids three lost three days of phys ed. Uh, and that's a more, that's a challenge that we can overcome, particularly in, you know, September when we typically have good weather. Um, that's less of a concern for me, but um, Could the day be forgiven? Uh, I, don't, I don't know what you mean by forgiven. I, I mean, mean, we have a contract with five different unions that dictates how many days they need to work and what their salaries are based on. Um, and we have kids who are deserved in education. Do you know what I mean? Sure. Who, no, what I mean by is that, like, for the for the services for the state trooper, we had appealed to Desi right. and asked if the day could be forgiven. So what I'm asking is, is would it be unusual to ask for those days to be forgiven. Or for us, if we're going 185 days and we need to go 180, could we uh, exchange out you know, those, those um, dates that the kids are missing school because of elections and not hold it against them? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I, that, that is actually a, a great larger civic idea. Like, should there be no work and no school on election days so that none of us have to worry about this stuff on a statewide level? Um, but in, in fact, the state rejected our request to have that day um, that where the state trooper was honored forgiven. They said yeah. that, that we could not, that we had to make it up. Um, but because we do um, a longer school year than is required by the state, this committee was able to say, we're going to okay. forgive that day. Right. Okay. Um, and we are in, we're pretty much in the same position for next year as that situation was leading us to this year, which was... Um, it was going to force the last day of school to be the Tuesday after Juneteenth is observed, which meant um, taking a three-day weekend and then coming back for one, one final day. day of school, which just doesn't, doesn't make a whole lot of sense in terms yeah. of people's ability to focus and pay, pay attention and really make that be a productive day. Um, and so I think that's something that, that folks need to think about when we're setting the beginning of the school year uh, is where is that end of the year going to land? Mm -hmm. And that's really what should determine what the start of the school year is. Um, but we don't want to get into a habit where what we're doing every year is saying, um, you know, we, we have these contracts and we've contracted with people for a certain number of days, but we're just going to keep releasing them. We're just going to keep forgiving them. It is still taxpayer money that we have hopefully uh, are doing the right thing. And on a rare occasion like we had this year that it was – absolutely beyond our control, um, that's one thing. But setting the calendar for next year is definitely something that's within our purview. So I would just give that to the committee to consider. Any, any other members? Uh, Ms. Franti. Uh, I understand both sides of the fence here. But in our last two elections, the one in November, the percentage rate was 20% on a full citywide election. And I'm sure the special election in December was less than that percentage. You can always vote absentee ballot if, if it's that important. The primary, I'm not sure how many people are going to be coming out because now you're dealing with, you know, long weekend, vacation, weather. So there could be different factors. I, I don't think it's a major concern for that one day. November, yes, I agree with that one. But the one in September, I don't agree with. And I think we can work around it somehow. 
And like I said, if people really want to vote, they'll find a way to do it. Thank you. Ms. Gravelisi. Thank you, Mayor Rigo. Um, and, you know, I don't think it's really the fact that, you know, people will find a way to vote because they will find a way to vote. Um, but, the, like, my position is, and, you know, obviously when I voted, I voted to close the schools on that day. And my reasoning for that is student safety. You know, that's my main reason behind it. So, you know, so, all right, so we don't think a lot of people are going to come out in September, so we'll just open the schools and, you know, you could have 50 to, to 200 people coming in, but we don't know who they are. We don't know where their background. They're in the schools with our students. We don't know if it's safe for them. Um, so now we say, all right, so we'll open because it's going to be small, but we'll close when it's a larger election. So now we set a precedence where we just make up our mind year to year what we decide it's going to be. So my justification in voting to close the schools for that day was to be consistent so people know what the calendar is. And my main concern is student safety. Thank you. Mrs. Rizzo. Yeah, I, I know student safety has come up for a few years. Um, but they also look at it when we have end of the year celebrations or when we have holiday concerts, we don't know who's coming immediately into the same room with our students. Um, so I, I think if we're talking about safety, maybe we need to be more on um, the Revere Police Department, securing the areas where the polling is taking place. Um, I mean, there's times I've seen people go in and out of the Lincoln School cafeteria, from the polling place into the cafeteria, which I've always had an issue with. Right. And so I think that is where, if they want to be in the schools, there needs to be more security as far as doing it. Um, I mean, I know this year, you know, we talked about the six with we didn't have all the facts we did discuss it but we made our decision um and as far as using the cafeterias like so many other times couldn't those two schools do bag lunches that day um i mean it's not the easiest it's not the most tastiest but i think if a, a student wanted a bag lunch and uh, not stay in school an extra day at the end of the year. I think they take the bag lunch, not that they should have the choice. Uh, I just, the school safety part, I think that should be handled with the election department and with the Riviera Police Department. We never worry about it at the spring concerts, the winter concerts, and we have not a clue of who's coming in. We have not a clue if they're quarried. Um, so I think there just could be some accommodations made to make it safer. Just my opinion. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kingston. I originally um, voted to have school that day, but um, from hearing Mr. Fahey speak, um, my understanding is um, that there was conversations that the school would be closed, that arrangements had been made, and plans had been made to vote in a certain way. Um, and while I would like to have school that day, I totally understand the election department. And I also thought about my vote to Ms. Gravelisi's point in the unlikely event that something did happen, um, that, that would be awful. And I do agree that, you know, possibly the, the police that were assigned there and work there um, could possibly help in that um, regard. I still think um, it does come down to safety and also the plans that were made um, by the election department to you know, have the election in that manner. Um, it is difficult to find help. The more places they have to find to do polling, um, it does make it difficult um, to, uh, to staff. Um, so I, while I did it originally vote to not have, to have school that day, I have changed my mind um, based on listening to Mr. Fahey today and giving it some more thought and also listening to Ms. Gravelisi's uh, point about the safety issue. So I would like to see us have, I would like to have Dr. Kelly not have school that day um, as far as, and I agree with Ms. Ellis, as far as, you know, day at the other end, depending on how the snow days fall and how the calendar falls, as Dr. Kelly said, sometimes going back for one day um, isn't, isn't the best uh, educationally or for, the, for anyone. 
Um, I think that's something we could look at next spring of 2023 and say, okay, what's the last day of school and where do we stand? And I think that conversation would be would happen then, but I have no problem with that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kingston. Uh, Ms. Gravelisi. Thank you, Mayor Rigo. And I just wanted to um, make another comment um, to Stacy's comment about, you know, not knowing who's coming into like the spring play and this and that. Obviously, post-COVID, I know that it's, things are just starting to pick up again, but to the best of my memory, pre-COVID, when I went to any of the schools, Beachmont, so on and so forth, I had to show my identification. Um, that's not the case with an election. You can't ask people for their identification. I've never been into a school to one of the plays where I haven't been asked for my ID at the front desk. I've, I've got to say, I've never... Well, it could also be that the people at the desk knew you. No, you know, because uh, going as a school committee person, I've always worn my badge. But can I also say, this is not on the agenda to be discussed right now. If we want to place it on the agenda and people want to come up and um, make a motion on it, that could be done at the next meeting. But we did hear from Mr. Fahey. We did hear Dr. Kelly's opinion on it. And um, so if anyone wants, we can place it on the agenda for next month. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Rizzo. We'll move on uh, and go back to the superintendent report, uh, Dr. Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We have um, two more quick items. Um, for the first one is not on the agenda, but I just wanted to give everybody an update on uh, graduation, which I think you all know the date is June 7th, and it will start at 6 p.m. at the Harry De La Russo Stadium. Um, the rain date is Thursday, June 9th. So I just wanted to emphasize that the original date is Tuesday the 7th. The rain date is Thursday the 9th, and that's because MCAS happens in between there. Um, we are having a safety meeting on Monday with, uh, with the police department and the fire department and the high school team, and I just want to let parents know that Dr. Rockwood will be sending uh, detailed information after that meeting. One of the things that we do want to work with the safety team on is finalizing the number of guests that each student, each graduate can bring. Um, and so once that's determined, that information will be shared with everybody. And then finally, um, as you all know, uh, throughout COVID, we have been staying ahead of the curve in terms of ensuring that we have all of the measures in place that we possibly can have to keep our students and staff safe. And that includes the pooled testing program that we've had since we returned to in-person learning um, the vaccine clinics that we've had, the at-home testing program on Thursdays that we've had, um, et cetera. And one thing that we've been asked to do um, by CIC Health, who is the partner that we work with on all of the testing, is to engage with them around two environmental testing pilot programs that they are um, piloting this year. And Dr. Gallucci is going to talk more about those two programs. But um, just briefly, I'll say that what they do is focus on the, on the environment, both wastewater and air, as measures of um, COVID levels instead of individual or pool testing. And uh, one of the reasons that we wanted to engage in this pilot is because we know that a lot of the funding that has paid for the pool testing that we've been engaged in uh, is going away. And we anticipate that next school year, we won't have the Monday pool testing and likely we won't have the Thursday at home testing either. And so we wanna be on the forefront of ensuring that we have some level of safety and testing in which we can engage. So um, Dr. Gallucci, I'm opening your presentation now. Why is this not opening right? Okay, there we go. Um, and I will share my screen and then turn the microphone over to you. All right, perfect. I know we're getting late, um, so I'm going to uh, thank Dr. Kelly for the framing and um, sip through the slides. Uh, so first and foremost, our partners at CIC have just been amazing in every way in providing kind of individualized testing for our students and staff. And when they approached us with this pilot, we thought it was a great idea, given some of the reasons that Dr. Kelly had said. But also, as I get to the end of this presentation, you'll see the potential beyond COVID for this work um, in infrastructure. 
Uh, you can click. I'm sorry. Oh, scroll. I forgot that I'm in charge of this. I know, sorry. Hold on. So kind of quick, quick description of what uh, environmental testing is. Uh, it's a larger scale test than the individualized test. It can be done at organizations. It can be done within the community via manholes or treatment facilities. Um, as Dr. Kelly said, the two types that we're engaging in are wastewater and air. And uh, if you've been following uh, the media throughout the pandemic, um, you've probably seen or heard that the wastewater testing at Deer Island by the MWRA has been an incredible predictor of COVID levels, uh, whether they're increasing or decreasing. Um, and so if you will, what we're setting up here, starting with three complexes and quickly expanding to eight, is kind of our own private wastewater monitoring system. Um, where we'll be able to determine how COVID levels are within each building. And then as we see increases, that, uh, we can obviously engage in, in further mitigation fact, uh, strategies um, as a school and, and as a district. The kind of simple science behind the wastewater testing, obviously asymptomatic individuals that are in those complexes use the restroom, the waste enters the sewer system. Um, they have set up collections at the um, I got to thank uh, Mr. Swenson as well. He's been working with them very carefully on floor plans um, and pipelines, and they've set up the collections at the base of the complexes. Uh, the wastewater is then analyzed via a PCR test, and obviously that data informs um, really our, the Revere Board of Health and uh, our, our public health actions as a school community. And so I, I should have said before, if we do see what we anticipate will happen next year is if we see some kind of a spike in our own wastewater that we would have access to state resources to pull in a testing team and um, try to quickly do some testing and identify who the positive folks are. Um, a kind of preview of what the sample reporting would look like, if you can imagine this is a city map. Uh, you would have levels at each of, in this case, they have about eight dots representing areas where they're sampling. That would be our schools. We, be able, we would be able to see the levels in each uh, of the eight complexes that house our 11 schools. So a second aspect of this um, pilot is uh, air monitoring. And uh, the company that CIC partners with is called Poppy. And um, they, would, they would be setting up these devices that you see here within the schools. In fact, they've already set them up um, at the three uh, pilot schools. Um, and these would also be able to monitor the presence of COVID-19, particularly in common areas, uh, potentially expanding even beyond common areas. Um, but it really gives us a good indication of where our airflow is and where our hotspots are. And um, if we are in the midst of a COVID spike, uh, we would able, be able to quickly identify these areas as congregation areas where the COVID levels are very high. Um, it's also a great tool for understanding airflow and improving our airflow within our buildings. So we're excited about that aspect as one piece that extends beyond COVID-19. And uh, next slide. So reports are sent over email and through an app uh, primarily, the reports are going to go to me initially. Uh, as, I, as I said, we're in the infancy of this pilot. Um, it will certainly uh, highlight the presence of COVID-19 across all of the monitors. And the third bullet point is probably, um, I would say, really the, the purpose of doing this and having that long-term vision. So it can also start to, to monitor other pathogens say flu or strep throat. And if you think about as a parent, when your child starts to show symptoms, the first thing you ask is what's going around right now? Um, and you're starting to do that networking to see kind of what people are experiencing. And now imagine a world, if you would, um, where you might be informed by your school that flu levels are currently high. Here's some great practices um, to keep your child safe. If you notice these symptoms, please have them get a flu test. Um, so this is kind of the, the image that shows the, the relationship between 
environmental testing, co constantly monitoring and surveilling the results, and being able to react to potential surges, uh, whatever they may be. And so, as I said, the current pilot um, is, can begin to offer additional panel testing, including flu is the kind of the big one I mentioned. But also, and this kind of uh, blew me away, but the air testing can provide further information on mold, lice, and other pathogens as well. Um, nice. And yeah, I know. Um, so the environmental testing really provides that additional public health benefit beyond COVID-19 and really has some staying power. Uh, and as the technology continues to be refined, the hope is that they can predict more diseases that are traceable and we can alert the community. So as I said, the um, wastewater collection sites are gonna be set up in eight schools. Right now they're set up at the Garfield Complex, Hill and Revere High School. Um, they're gonna set up 16 air monitoring sites in the pilot three schools that I just mentioned. Uh, data will be collected on a weekly basis and we'll continue to use this data to compare to our individualized pool testing and Thursday at home testing data. And that's a really good point right there. We're starting this work now so that we can assure that there is an alignment between what we're seeing and what we know are known surveillance methods and this new method before we get to a point where we think this is going to be the one method that's going to be available to us. And so really, if, if all come true, uh, this is a really great way of imagining an infrastructure um, to really help support not only our efforts as a school system with public health, but um, we've also engaged our invaluable partner, Lauren Buck, who uh, has been meeting with the team and just gaining information um, to really expand even beyond the school systems at some point uh, after this initial pilot is complete and we start to see um, its success, hopefully. Thank you, uh, Dr. Colucci. Any members have any questions or comments? No Ms. question, just how wonderful it, it is and how lucky we are to be part of it. And think of the future, you know? I think when people found cures for previous diseases and then we're the beneficiaries that maybe what we're doing now will benefit people in the future too. Thank you for, for Thank you for the presentation, Dr. Gallucci. Thank you, Dr. Kelly and the mayor for your leadership. And if I can just, just add one thing, I do want to say that I know that one of the reasons CIC reached out to us is because Dr. Gallucci has been such a critical partner to them in everything that we've done throughout all of this COVID testing. And I know that they looked at him as somebody who was ready and able um, to bring on a new program that could impact students across the Commonwealth. Excellent. Uh, Ms. Gravelisi. Thank you, Mayor Arrigo. Um, I also think it's a great program. I mean, it's been tested and true that, you know, the wastewater will show the COVID rates. I'm curious, has CIC partnered with any other school districts or cities or towns, and which ones are they and what, how successful have they been? I, ask, I actually didn't ask that question, oh. but from my conversations, I got the impression that we were the first. Okay. Um, I think there may be possibly others alongside us, but they just started the installations last week, so it's that new, um, and we're just going to start to get results either this week or the coming week um, from the, the systems that they've set up. And I should also thank the custodial staffs at all the buildings because they have been touring this team and doing such a great job and showing them the spots that they need to yeah. access. Which is great. You said they set up the air monitors so far, and then obviously they have their own specific way of testing wastewater, which Correct. I don't really want to know about. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, do they have to partner with like DPW, um, the water department, or any of that to like, you know, are they like being like intrusive to the piping sewerage system? No. Nope. Like, so um, Carl Swenson, I, the first connection that I made was to them. So any of that permissions in terms of tapping into wastewater collection would have been handled by Carl. Okay. I believe, and I believe the yeah. collection is happening at the point where the wastewater collects and exits the building. Yeah. Thank you. Such a gross. <laughs> Any other, uh, Mr. Franti. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Richie, how long is the pilot program going to be good for? <coughs> so they haven't given me an end date, um, but they are committed. And in, in this is relatively new science, right? So the they're very appreciative that we're willing to house this. So my hope is that it's going to have a little bit of lasting power. Okay. Thank you. OK. We'll move on now to uh, public hearings. We have two. The first is a public hearing uh, for the conversion of Seacoast to an innovation school. I will open. Uh, the public hearing to proponents. Hearing and seeing none. We'll move on to opponents. Hearing and seeing none. I'll open it to uh, committee members. I'd like to hear from Dr. Kelly first. Okay, so we'll hear from Dr. Kelly. This is this is something we do every year. Yeah. And um and of course I'm going to vote no. No. Well, the, I just is... want to be clear that this hearing is on the oh, innovation school at Seacoast. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Not, right. sorry. sorry. The next one is not the one school that we choice. do. All the time. But I, I will just say for uh, folks who are listening at home and may not know, but um, Dr. Mulligan made an extensive presentation. Uh, along with her staff and students last month. So the, the, the committee is very aware of the proposal for Seacoast to become an innovation school. Um, and the last step in that process is to actually take a vote in support of that. Um, the staff have already voted to support the proposal. Um, so we know that there is a lot of willingness to do this. I do want to uh, thank um, committee woman Rizzo, who was part of the innovation team along with me and a few other people to help uh, make sure that the innovation plan met the needs, the expectations uh, of the school committee in general. Mrs. Rizzo, would you like to say anything? Um, like we said, we've talked about this the last couple of months and the positive um, factors that will come into place for our students there. And all these decisions um, are made with what is best for the students. Um, so with that, I would like to make a motion to accept the Seacoast Innovation Plan. Motion. Uh, motion made and seconded by Ms. Franti. Uh, roll call. Mrs. Bronson Rizzo? Yes. Mr. Ferranti? Yes. Mrs. Gravelisi? Yes. Mr. Kingston? Yes. Ms. Yes. Mrs. Milbury Ellis? Yes. Ms. Ty? Yes. Mayor Arrigo? Yes. Okay. Well, now, oh, Dr. Kelly. If I could say one more thing on that, I should mention that Dr. Mulligan wasn't able to make it tonight because she's actually on the interview committee for the new high school principal, and there are interviews happening as we speak. Okay. The, uh, the next item on our agenda is a public hearing relative to school choice and uh, this is being done in accordance with the provisions of section 61 of chapter 71 of the Massachusetts general laws uh, that we conduct a public hearing uh, this evening uh, to discuss and vote the enrollment of non-resident students also known as school choice in the Revere Public Schools. I will open it up to uh, proponents Hearing and seeing none, I will move on to opponents. Side will be closed, uh, and we will move on to Dr. Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, as you know, um, we do take this vote every year, as Ms. Ty started to say, um, in thinking that we were already on this agenda item. Uh, many districts, uh, the school committee will vote to accept students from other nearby communities, typically nearby and to allow those students to enroll in their schools. The conditions in Revere have been such that we have been overcrowded, as you know, for a long, long time. And we just don't have room in our classrooms to accept students from other districts. In some districts, it makes sense. When, they're, when their uh, classrooms are not full, or when they have more building space than they know what to do with, accepting students from other communities can help increase their funding uh, by increasing their enrollment. That's not the case that we find ourselves in here. Um, and so I would urge the committee to vote no 
uh, on the on the option of accepting students from other schools into the Riviera Public Schools. So on the school choice vote, a vote no means that you would not allow students to come from other districts into Riviera. Okay, is there a motion? Well, we'll have to be Ms. very Ms. careful how we Ms. word that motion because I was going to make the motion in a negative that we vote not to participate in school choice and that we not allow, which is I think what we have done over the years. No, now if, so if that's okay with you, that's, that's the way I'll put it, all right. I feel very passionate about this. Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, Mr. Mr. Ty, have at it. So can I just clarify one more time for sure. the folks at home? Um, so Ms. Ty is gonna propose that we not allow students from outside of Riviera to attend our public schools. And in that regard, I would request that the committee vote yes to not allow the kids from other districts into our schools. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. And so for the reasons that Dr. Kelly just stated, I move that we vote, that this school committee vote no uh, on allowing students from, non-resident students, students from other school systems to participate in the wonderful education that we give here in Revere. No on school choice. Motion made by so Ms. Ty. Oh, yeah. Second. Go ahead. Go ahead. Seconded Let's by... Oh, go, go ahead. We will not be participating in school's choice. Correct. Correct. Motion made by Ms. Ty, seconded by Mrs. Rizzo. Uh, roll call. Mrs. Bronson Rizzo? Yes. Mr. Ferranti? Yes. Mrs. Gravelisi? Yes. Mr. Kingston? Yes. Mrs. Milbury Ellis? Yes. Ms. Ty? Yes. Mayor Arrigo? Yes. We'll move on to the next item on our agenda, which is the report of the subcommittees. Any subcommittee reports? Yes, Ms. Ty Ms. and Mr. Ty. Kingston. And Ms. Kingston. Ms. Ty? Okay. The um, personnel subcommittee of the Revere School Committee met. Uh, we had two items on the agenda. Two. One of them was on the um, adjustment of salaries for our highest administrators, except of course in central office, the principals, who are the crucial people in, in school. But that is not within our purview uh, to establish any kind of salary schedule for them. Uh, once Ed Reform came in, that purview was given specifically and only to the superintendent. So we were not, um, we did not vote on any recommendation on that. However, the, uh, the second issue was on hiring new instructional, uh, in, in hiring for new instructional uh, positions. And we did that in a, for a number of people. And I'd like to just list uh, the enhancements that we approved. Uh, for the Wayland School, a reading specialist. For the Beachmont School, a bilingual social worker. For the Garfield Elementary, another ELL teacher, which we desperately need, and a math interventionist. For the Hill School, a new classroom for the first grade. Uh, I wish we could do more of that, but it's wonderful that we can do that with it at the Hill. Um, also at the Hill, another ESL teacher. At the Lincoln School, a full-time ETL in the SPED department and a full-time ESL, English as a Second Language. In the Paul Revere, uh, also an ETL for the SPED department, in the RMA, an ELL, the English language learners, the SBA, a new um, L uh, EL teacher also, uh, for the life skills class, and also a health teacher as an encore position. Among other things we have done at Revere High School, another ELL teacher and a coach to be teaching in the small learning group. Um, the district will uh, follow to adjust principal salaries as the superintendent brings that information to us. We are also okayed an assistant EL director. 
Uh, and for the district, the Lincoln School will have a new AP, and this time, assistant principal, in this time of, um, after we've gone through so long of disruption, and the, uh, we decided that we needed a new AP assistant principal for the Lincoln School. Um, there will also be more elementary language de development coaches, more middle language development coach, an EL secretary, uh, because we're going to share the job for the person who has it now. She'll be sharing her job with another person. Uh, we've also decided that we, and actually the wonderful presentation we had in art tonight sort of emphasizes how important our art department is. And we've decided to have a director of fine arts. We need a director of comprehensive health, which we used to have some years ago, and that person was very valuable in there, and I'm sure we will have the same. And uh, those, that's it for the enhancement of the um, school department. Motion to accept the um, positions that were just read by Ms. Ty. Second. Roll call. Mrs. Bronson Rizzo? Yes. Mr. Fr yes. Mrs. Gravelisi? Yes. Mr. Kingston? Yes. Mrs. Milbury Ellis? Yes. Ms. Ty? Yes. Mayor Rigo? Yes. Mr. Kingston? The Plant and Maintenance Committee had a meeting. Um, we asked uh, Carl Swenson and the director to attend. Um, after some discussion, it was um, uh, decided to um, favor the report out of to buy a bobcat type of equipment for the Garfield School. The Garfield School presents some challenges with snow removal, and Mr. Swenson uh, felt that that type of piece of equipment could really help with the um, layout of the Garfield School in the area that needs to be uh, taken care of during snowstorms. The second item on the um, agenda was um, for sound equipment in the in the um, Revere High School Auditorium. Um, the high school auditorium is used by the whole entire community. Um, at for schools, uh, for instance, the Romney will have a production there shortly. Um, so additional sound equipment um, was requested in for the uh, high school auditorium to be used not only by the high school students, but the community, other schools in the community as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kingston. Motion to accept the report of the building subcommittee. Second. Roll call. Mrs. Bronson Rizzo? Yes. Mr. Ferranti? Yes. Mrs. Gravelisi? Yes. Mr. Kingston? Yes. Mrs. Milbury Ellis? Yes. Ms. Ty? Yes. Mayor? Yes. Should we just clarify that that was the plant and maintenance subcommittee? My apologies. <laughs> Mrs. Rizzo. Okay, very quickly. Um, I just want to say thank you to the assistance of Dr. Christina Porter. Um, we have a slate of um, students for the Student Advisory Committee for the 22-23 year. Um, it would consist of two freshmen, Madison McQuado and Nicole De Silva, two sophomores, Santiago Gilbetancourt and Raham Amen, and our very own Elni Lopez de Jesus. Um, and we were lucky enough that T the two freshmen came to represent Revere in the student representation workshop this past weekend, and they were a great representation. Um, so we'll be looking at um, the next steps for these students, and we'll definitely be hearing more from them. Um, and it, for the viewing public that doesn't realize, um, this is uh, Massachusetts law that um, these five students um, are here at the high school um, to discuss student voice or um, anything having to do with the student culture. Um, and they always um, pick one of them to represent our, themselves to sit on our committee. Um, I will be 
entertaining a meeting um, soon about maybe having two on board. So um, I say congratulations to them, and I'm looking forward to meeting with them. Thank you, Mrs. Rizzo. Uh, any other members? Okay. Uh, we'll move on to motions. Which we have two. Oh, yep. uh, Dr. Kelly. So um, I just want to thank you, Mayor Rigo, and I want to thank uh, Mr. Ferranti for participating in the contract negotiations with our AFSCME two units, Unit 93 and 93A. Um, we negotiated for a very, very long time, uh, which might make it seem like it was more arduous than it actually was. Uh, I am, as I have been throughout COVID, very thankful to our colleagues in the AFSCME um, units who really stepped up and did whatever they could, whenever they could, whatever needed to be done uh, throughout COVID. And we saw the same thing happening in negotiations, but they were protracted because they had a change in, in some oversight from the state agency and um, because truthfully they were so collaborative that uh, I, I think that maybe we didn't have the same sense of urgency that we might have had with some other units. Um, so I, I am very thankful to the people who are on the negotiating team. Um, they did have representation from all of the different uh, aspects uh, with uh, Mark Scabo representing the custodians along with Jimmy Sacuzzo who helped him with that, Dave Patch who represented the bus drivers, um, uh, I should mention Dee Dee Can was also representing the custodians, Pauline Lyons representing the full-time cafeteria workers, um, I know that I'm going to forget people, Christine uh, Cavanaro representing secretaries, uh, and we had other members who were um, representing our part-time workers for cafeteria, but to a person, everybody who worked with us really did uh, sit at the table and do the back and forth, and you know, none of us leave feeling like uh, you won, because uh, the whole point of uh, negotiations is collaboration and, and mediation and finding the middle of the road, give and take. Um, so thank you to Michael and thank you to the mayor and thank you to everybody on the AFSCME team and I apologize to those couple of people whose names I have omitted in my utter exhaustion at this hour of the night. But. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Dr. Kelly. Uh, any other members? Okay. Uh, so there are two motions. Uh, one, the first is a motion to approve the memorandum of agreement between the Revere School Committee and AFSCME 93. So moved, Mr. Mayor. Second. Uh, roll call. Mrs. Bronson Rizzo? Yes. Mr. Ferrant? Yes. Mr. Mrs. Gravelisi? Yes. Mr. Kingston? Yes. Ms. Mrs. Milbury Ellis? Yes. Ms. Ty? Yes. Mayor Arrigo? Yes. The second motion is a motion to approve the memorandum of agreement between Revere School Committee and AFSCME 93A. So moved, Mr. Chairman? Second. Roll call. Mrs. Bronson Rizzo? Yes. Mr. Ferranti? Yes. Mrs. Gravelisi? Yes. Mr. Kingston? Yes. Mrs. Milbury Ellis? Yes. Ms. Ty? Yes. Mayor Arrigo? Yes. Uh, we'll now move on. Ms. Ty? Uh, at this time, it's usually when we have completed negotiations. Oh, sorry. At this time, when we have already com completed negotiations well, with all of our units, it is customary for us uh, to deal with people who are non-union people. And so at this time, I'd like to make a motion that we grant the same salary increase uh, that has been granted throughout the school system to all non-union employees and other enhancements that have been added to the AFSCME uh, contract and are applicable to non-union workers will be granted to them also. Second. Roll call. Mrs. Bronson Rizzo? Present. Mr. Ferranti? Yes. Mrs. Gravelisi? Yes. Mr. Kingston? Yes. Mrs. Mrs. Milbury Ellis? Yes. Ms. Ty? Yes. Mayor Arrigo? Yes. Okay. We'll now move on to uh, old business. Any old business that members would like to take up? Seeing none, we'll move on to new business. Dr. Kelly. Um, this is just a very brief piece, and I probably should have put this on the committee of the whole instead of here, but I wanted to just notify the committee that 
uh, I've been asked to join the college board um, as an advisor um, oh. to their steering committee. Uh, I have accepted, unfortunately, their next meeting is on June 7th, which is graduation, so I have declined that invitation uh, and told them that I will catch up with them at the next one. Thank you. Great. Good news. Congratulations. Okay. Any other members have anything? Uh, at this point, we will... Oh, Mrs. Rizzo. I'm, I'm very sorry, and I realize it's late, but um, I think it's very important if we could take a moment of silence for our student, Edward Aguirre Contreras, who um, just passed away a couple of days ago. Um, Edwin had such an infectious smile, and he was always a student. If we went to the... the um, Garfield for any of their concerts. I would love to just sit there and watch him because he was just so animated and had so much fun at those concerts. So I'll take from me that smiling face and um, prayers, condolences to um, the people at Garfield, his family, and all his friends. So if we could kindly take a moment of silence. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Rizzo. Um, seeing no further business, uh, I Mr. will. Chairman, oh, Mr. Franti. I just want to remind everybody that we're having our second budget meeting on Wednesday at 10 o'clock. Uh, everybody's invited to the meeting. I'm not sure if the invitations went out yet, but I just want to remind everybody that's our second meeting and appreciate everybody could attend. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members? Uh, seeing no further business, we will adjourn the Revere School Committee meeting of May 17th. Thank you.